So a question has arisen, uh, are we still a democracy? One of the guys who actually asked that question is me, because I keep talking about how money has corrupted our politics and that at the national level, we don't really have a functioning democracy anymore because our politicians aren't listening to us. Well, that's my opinion based on all the different stories that I've covered over the last 17, 18 years of covering politics. But now, some Princeton researchers, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, actually went back and did a study on this issue. They studied 1,779 different policy initiatives between 1981 and 2002. And then they published uh, in uh, Perspectives on Politics, a very uh, respected journal. Uh, it's called Testing Theories of American Politics. So let's talk about how they did it. They said they then compared those policy changes, the ones that they studied, with the expressed opinion of the United States public, comparing the preference of the average American at the 50th percentile of income to what those Americans at the 90th percentile preferred, as well as the opinions of major lobbying or business groups. So now this is a really interesting way of doing it. They take an issue, they see which way did it go in the voting, right? And then they say, all right, at the time, what was the public opinion poll on the 50th percentile? And then the top 10% and then lobbyists and, and business groups. I, I'm on pins and needles as I'm reading the beginning of this story to see how it turned out. Well, I have bad news for you guys. Quote, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Well, that is devastating. Now, remember, this is before Citizens United. It's certainly before McCutcheon. And remember that we started talking about money in politics, and we started talking about Wolfpack before Citizens United. That's because, as I've told you on this show many times, the two devastating cases actually came in 1976 and 1978. Buckley v. Vallejo where they said money is speech and 78 where they said corporations have First Amendment rights and can spend money in politics. Ever since then, it has been an evolving disaster. And since then, as you can see from this study, over 1,800 different policies and you had almost no effect on that. Now, this would be generally called an oligarchy. So look, a lot of times that word is thrown out and people don't know what it means. I, so I think it's important to define it. Uh, policy might define it for you here, and I thought it was a good job, so let me read that to you. An oligarchy is a system where power is effectively wielded by a small number of individuals defined by their status called oligarchs. Members of the oligarchy are the rich, the well-connected, and the politically powerful as well as particularly well-placed individuals and institutions like banking and finance or the military. Now usually, Russia is referred to as an oligarchy and a lot of other countries that are run by a small set of elites are referred to as an oligarchy, but almost never the United States. Well, it turns out, in reality, going all the way back to 1981 is when it starts. Uh, we, in fact, were run by small elites. And, uh, to me, it's not damning of all the rich, right? Your doctor didn't have anything to do with this. Oprah didn't have anything to do with it. It's people who are politically powerful and actually use that power to their advantage and to your disadvantage. Now, to that point, let me go to a different set of numbers put together by other professors uh, that recently had news, got news too, which is very important. Uh, let me show you a chart here of how the different uh, percentages did in America since 1980. And it's always 1980 that it goes back to. So, in fact, if you're more clear on that, it's 1978 is when all the charts start diverging. And as you can see there, you've got bottom 20%, middle 60%, and the next 19% doing okay. They're hanging in there. And to look, to be fair, they're actually rising a tiny bit through those decades. But that top line is the top 1%. And they are doing spectacular. And that's not an accident, that's over decades of time. That shows you a pattern. The pattern is the rules have been fixed in their favor. Okay? Now, has it gotten better? Look, we have had a Democratic president who lobbied and campaigned on change, and he's been in power for five years. In fact, as of September of 2013, since the Great Recession began in 2008, those five years, the top 1%, captured 95% of all income gains since the Great Recession ended. 
Isn't that an amazing number? So when they say the economy is recovering, you have to understand something. It's not recovering for you. It's recovering for the top 1%. One more devastating fact about that, since September of 2013, the 99% saw a net 12% drop to their income. So since that's meaning the time between the great when the Great Recession started in 2008 to September of 2013. So unlike the earlier chart from decades ago, it's now gotten so bad, perhaps because of Citizens United adding fuel to that fire, and putting the money in politics on steroids, it's now gotten to the point, even when the economy recovers, actually 99% of us still lose. Our income is no longer going up incrementally, or a tiny bit, it's now going down. And after Citizens United, then we just recently got McCutcheon, which lifts even more limits on campaign financing. Look, it's not a small little issue, campaign finance reform. It's not like, oh, well, look, I have strong feelings about war, which makes sense, or I have strong feelings about the environment, which makes sense. This is about our democracy. So your opinions on war, taxes, all that stuff is irrelevant if you don't live in a democracy. If you live in an oligarchy, they don't give a damn about your opinions on those issues anyway. There's only one issue. Who controls our politicians? And if you do private financing of elections, you will have the people who gave those large donations who control our politicians. That is obvious. It's a matter of logic. And now, through this study, it's a matter of fact. One more set of devastating graphs for you. Um, first of all, the study's conclusion on our democracy, just to be clear, is America's claims to being a democratic society are seriously threatened. Now, uh, I tend to think that they are understating that. I think at the national level, not at the state level, not at the local level, because I've seen democracy work there. But at the national level, when you're talking about Washington, D.C., it is not seriously threatened. It's gone. It's over. I mean, look, you just saw the numbers, but I'll give you more, as I said. Here are the graphs. Average citizens' preferences, how much did it affect policy? The line is what you have to concern yourself with there, okay? Well, that's what they're talking about when they say your opinion is insignificant. It did not make any difference. Flat. Sorry. Not interested. All right. Well, if all the lines are that way, you might say, oh, okay, well, at least it's fair. Let's take a look at the line for economic elites' preferences. Yeah, that's a different line. That's the line that says it was highly correlated to the policy. The policy was connected to what the economic elites preferred. That is not an accident, it is by design. And how about interest group alignments, donors, lobbyists, special interests, also very much aligned. We do not run our government. They run our government. I know that's really bad news. Of course, I think we can take it back. If you want to know how, you go to wolf-pack.com. Now, why did I start Wolfpack? Because I already saw this. I saw it in every story I covered. I saw it in every political article. The person with more money, the, issue, the sign with more money, won in every single instance. That's why we started Wolfpack in the first place. If you don't get a constitutional amendment to fix this, we're done for. We might as well just bow our heads and say, yes, they rule us and accept our fate. But I don't accept that fate. Throughout American history, brave men and women have fought back. And in Wolfpack, we've got high school students. We've got people who are disabled. We've got people of every different background, race, ethnicity, age group, and you know what they're doing? They're calling their local state representatives, senators, and they are having a tremendous impact. And when you see democracy works, it's amazing. When you actually get a representative or senator to care about his constituents and to introduce legislation to fix things, it's the most wonderful thing you've ever seen. And then you really believe in democracy. Thank God it still exists at the state level. And we don't need Washington at all to fix this. It's in the US Constitution. Because the guys who are brave enough in the first place to give us that democracy, or as Benjamin Franklin said, a republic if we can keep it, knew that a day like this would come. That's why they put it in Article 5 of the Constitution. 
that you can get an amendment to the Constitution without using Washington at all. The states call for a convention for a specific amendment, and then the Constitution is above the Supreme Court, it's above Congress. It's the American people roaring back and saying, we'll, uh, you know what, our government, thank you very much, we'll take that back. You see what the results are when you do nothing. Uh, join us and see what the results can be when we do something together. Wolf-Pack.com